from when I was very, very young, when I you know, was trying to figure out life and going around understanding and look at watching movies, the idea of ancient civilizations that had been shown in everything from Disney movies all the way up to regular movies truly like captivated my, my attention and my heart. There was something about that that really grabbed me that I didn't really understand until later on when I started getting involved in this. And after studying many, many years of geology and astronomy and climatology and biology and all these things, this came later in my life. And so when I looked at all these things and I started working with understanding ancient megaliths and the geology involved in this and understanding the difference, it became, it was very easy for me because I had done a lot of the work to try to understand it from a holistic standpoint. And I think that's one of the things that's difficult for a lot of people when they look at things like the different megalithic block sizes at a site and knowing the difference between why some are much more sophisticated and, sophi and, and significant and others are much more crude and primitive. And that's what I want to try to um, lay down as a foundation to start here. So the whole point of this that we're going to go into an exploration is, is there an entire chapter or chapters of our history that have been lost, have become nothing more than a myth and a legend to us? And furthermore, is there a cycle of Earth catastrophes that, that occur that's related to ice ages and um, ocean current disruptions and different solar events and different things in our, in our um, solar system and galaxy that play a part in these disappearances of these civilizations. And the first thing on the screen I want to just point out, for anyone that's in this room, I don't suspect this is the case, but if, if there are people out there that are saying, well, I don't, I'm not really quite sure about this still, I'm on the fence, I want to just point out an example. The, the image on the left is from Ollante Tambo in South America. And this shows you, a, this is probably one of the better examples you can see of how there are two distinct civilizations that have existed here. The, w the blocks on the bottom are massive granite blocks, very, very hard, very difficult to manipulate, and they are cut in a very precise way. And on top is a very crude um, type of like a mortar and small stone cobble that is from what we think of as the classical Inca. But the, the stones on the bottom are from a civilization that we don't really know much about. And the first thing to identify is that that is part of our lost history. That's what remains of it. Um, and the picture on the top right is from Eridu in ancient Sumer. And of course, that's a, a site very dear to my heart that a lot of people know. And on that, you can see that you have the remnants of an ancient temple literally buried and disintegrated in a, in a, in a mountain. Uh, and the bottom right is Baalbek, Lebanon. Just another example of these um, gigantic megaliths that really were, was one of the only things left behind from this lost chapter. And I want to just quickly point out the significance of that. Um, look at our civilization today. Very technological. Most things are kept in digital form. We have things in paper still. But we don't do any of these ancient megaliths like they used to do. We incorporate some of them occasionally into like libraries and, and certain centers of commerce, you see some large stones. But most of the buildings today are um, brick or metal or glass in some cases. And if, if we had a catastrophe come through um, that on the scale of what they dealt with, which we're going to get into, you know, what would be left from us? What would remain from our civilization? There truly wouldn't be much left. Because the things that we build and the way that we um, basically catalog our information and keep track of everything is, is disposable. It doesn't, it, it doesn't survive the, the, um, the tests of time. It's something that if those things came through and wiped us out, which you know, I, I don't think will happen, but if it did happen, you know, 200 years, 500 years, 1,000 years, 10,000 years, what would be left from us? Would they ever even know that we existed? Maybe they would find some traces of plastic in the ocean or something, you know, there wouldn't be much. And that's why this, this sheer significance of how many of these remains we find around the world shows us how significant these civilizations were, how technologically signific significant in their own way. And the fact that I feel like in many ways we have fallen from this time and we're trying to figure out just what they knew and we're, we're, we're get kind of trying to come back to that point. Now, here's a great example of, of what I'm talking about. Some people might not know what this is. If you have um, heard of this, 
I know Brian Forster's in Mexico City right now looking at this. This is called the monolith of Tlaloc. This is the largest single monolith in all of Mexico. And Mexico has some megaliths and some remnants of these civilizations that we're talking about, these lost civilizations that, just to give you a time frame, you know, we're looking at anything before about 10,000 years ago. Because it seems that some of the survivors of these catastrophes tried to rebuild, but then they were wiped out after and they disappeared. And so the monolith of Tlaloc is a 170 ton basalt monolith, a single stone, okay? And it was found completely buried in a field um, next to some forest. And a local was just walking one day and he saw the top of it sticking out, okay? Buried under layers and layers and layers and layers of sediment. And that's key to remember because when they uncovered it, they found that it was an enormous monolith that didn't have any connection to the Toltec or the Aztec or any of the classical civilizations in that area. So who built it? Modern archaeologists are going to tell you that the Aztec or the Toltec built this, but they didn't. This is, first of all, the fact that this is basalt means that the tools that they had available in our classical time period in our history books would have been impossible to manipulate this stone. S the fact that it's 170 tons brings up a lot of questions like how did they even move it? You know, and we're going to see this theme come up over and over again as we go along, showing more and more examples of how incredibly sophisticated these, this chapter or chapters older than 10,000 years ago was. Now, how far back do they go? We can speculate, but I would say at least 50,000 years ago. We're talking about civilization at a higher level of sophistication existing. Now, the, the image on the right is a very cool image that a lot of people haven't seen. This is when the um, Mexico government and the archaeological community decided to move this megalith to Mexico City in 1964, look at the size of the truck that they had to move that. How would a civilization before 10,000 years ago, how would they even move this? We, uh, we honestly have no idea. And this is echoed all around the world in so many other stones. And this isn't even the biggest one. This one, in some cases, is small. But it shows us that we're talking about an entire chapter that we know very little about. And someday, our history books will need to be rewritten. And we will finally understand that there was a chapter that existed before us that n had all the answers. And we're trying to catch up to understand what they knew. Now, here's a great example. A lot of people know Machu Picchu, right? Beautiful site, um, South America and Peru. And um, the image on the right is, one of the is something that I created to show a perfect example of the different phases or epochs of civilizations that have come and gone. You could call it, I guess you could say, they inherited these, these sites, and they knew that the energetic importance of those sites, the spiritual and energetic importance based on the earth and the cosmos, meant that they needed to build there. There was a specific purpose, and it had nothing to do anywhere on the world you see um, any of these civilizations we're looking at. It had nothing to do with availability of water or agriculture, or any of these things that we think of as like a random, randomization of wanting to build there just because of that. They built here because they knew things about the Earth, and they knew things about these ley lines and these energetic convergence zones of the planet, and they knew things about the cosmos that we frankly have no idea about. So that's why they built these temples where they did. Now, the image on the right is, is one that is probably the best example of showing the different phases of civilizations that I know of. In this wall on next, next to the Torreon in Machu Picchu shows three se sequences of different civilizations that came and, and went. Now, we're told that, that everything in, in, our, in our history um, archaeologically is in a linear form. It's a progressive linear form, meaning that it starts simple and primitive and it becomes more advanced the later it goes. But what we're finding around the world is the complete opposite. We're finding that the highest level of sophistication is on the bottom in almost every case that these, that these locations are identified. And the more you get to the top, the more primitive it gets. And it, that just shows you everything you need to know. It shows you that the original civilization had knowledge that seemed to be something beyond our understanding. You know, where they got that is a whole other discussion. But they knew knowledge and how to build these and how to do something that we can't even do today. 
a lot of the megaliths we find is places like Tiwanaku, in this andesite um, rock we find that's one of the hardest rocks on Earth. They have, they've had masons and stonemasons go down and look at that, and they have no idea how these civilizations carve these. They have, even with our tools today, let alone Bronze Age tools. And so this example shows you that the Inca, and the Inca that we're taught in school, they're the ones who built that little thing that's green on top, okay? That little small cobble on top. And the, the one that's right above it, I guess you between the orange and the yellow, that's a very interesting thing because what that shows us is that that megalithic civilization on the bottom that was wiped out, those, the blocks on top were from the survivors. They tried to rebuild and they knew about how to create some of the megaliths, but not at the, the level of the, the civilization below that. That, sh that tells you a story. It tells you that whoever those, that group was that survived that, they had limited capacity to be able to do what the other civilization did. And then when they were wiped out and disappeared, the civilization on top almost knew nothing about how to do it. They are using just very primitive means. And so that's what we're talking about here is that a significant amount of knowledge in chapters of human history based on um, connections around the world was systematically wiped out from catastrophes. And a lot of this presentation is going to go into why I think that is and get into some things that maybe you've never heard of, I'm hoping. Here's a great example. Um, one of the things that we look at is we try to identify this, the scope of this civilization. You know, how big was it? Was it, was it worldwide? What we're finding is that it was. It was a worldwide civilization that was all connected with the same knowledge. And we know that because the type of structures that they built and the writings they left behind all have the same, relatively the same information, the same themes, the same knowledge, the same level of knowledge. And one of the things we find is that we, we look at ancient Sumerian tablets and we find things called the Apkalu. These seven Apkalu are supposed to be these sages of Mesopotamia that are described as traveling around the world, creating civilizations, teaching them everything they knew, and then moving on. Now think about that for a minute. Moving on. So then you have a civilization come up, and it's a grand civilization, and then some, some certain, you know, maybe special bloodline kings or whoever are ruling it, and then they die, and then eventually the knowledge of that just becomes lost. And then if they get destroyed, who has any, un any idea of how to do these again? And nobody did. And that's what we're finding. So the top left image is from Ollanta Tamboy again is in Peru. And the bottom left is one of the new civilizations that people haven't really talked about that are in this realm is some of these pre-Greek civilizations that we're finding some incredible megaliths. And that, that connects all the way to Plato and Solon in Egypt and talking about how there was at least two grand civilizations that were existing at the same time. And they talked about how they were known as the Atlanteans and the ancient Athenians. And that's something that isn't really discussed too often is that, look, there was another parallel civilization to the Atlanteans and they went to war. That's exactly what it describes in these ancient Egyptian texts that Solon talked to the priests of S the temple of Sais and they told him, they said, Solon, you Greeks remember one deluge, but there have been many that have come and gone, mostly based on water and fire that have destroyed these civilizations. And so they, s they don't state that there was one destruction, but many. And that's exactly what we're finding, is that these civilizations had started at the height of their sophistication, probably coming out of Sumer. And I have some theories based on where that started and where it ended up. But, it, but in the end, look at the scope of this. Peru, Greece, Egypt, Japan. Right there, you basically cover the whole globe. And then everything in between. And notice the, the sophistication of the megaliths in each one of these examples. It is something that in, in, in many cases we can't even do today. Now, for those who are still on the fence about this, be like, well, you know, don't give them credit. Maybe they knew things, you know, the civilizations that are younger did this. And they're, they're kind of on the fence. Well, here's an, um, some examples that I think should help um, change that theory around and maybe make, make you look at this in a different way. We find evidence of sophisticated tools that they had that they were using to manipulate these stones. And one of the problems is, is that we've never found one of these tools ever. 
We have no idea where they went. We have no idea what they were. All we can look at is what they did, and we can speculate based on that. Now, top right, I want to point out for a second, that is a type of granite that's one of the hardest stones in the world from Abu Sir in Egypt. That granite on the most hardness scale is a seven or an eight. What that means is that any kind of a Bronze Age tool or anything that's uh, a more primitive tool like we're told from this time period would be impossible to manipulate these types of stones. But furthermore, what we're seeing on the top right screen are perfectly, perfectly circular drill holes. Something that is like our tools today. And then uh, furthermore, on the left side in the Giza Plateau, those are saw marks. Okay? So you're seeing drill holes and these saw marks. And in the bottom right, you're seeing these scoops. That's the best way you can describe them. These scoops that were somehow scooping out granite like it was like a backhoe or something. And we have no idea what any of these tools are, but the only thing we do know is that they had to have been hard enough to be able to manipulate these stones. Something like a diamond tip blade or something that is very sophisticated and the problem is that we have no idea where the tools went, but we have the remnants of what they created. So now that bottom right image, that is what, that's how they took out the giant obelisks in Egypt. They would scoop out underneath and then they would lift them out and then carve them in a in, in more precise way. But the point, the point of looking at that is, look, it was never finished. They were in the middle of working on it and then they disappeared. That's a theme you're going to see come up over and over again as we go along here. And that's precisely why I created this slide right here. Now, some are going to say, if they say, well, the civilization probably went to war and then they stopped working on their projects because maybe they, their, their empires collapsed or they ran out of resources or something. But this, this example right here is, to me, the evidence that shows that something happened very suddenly, very abruptly, and it was something that they weren't planning on. Th the reason I say that is that each one of these examples, the left example is the Yangshan Quarry in China. Um, it's one of, the civils one of the areas that doesn't get a lot of attention. But that is not a natural stone that is weathered off that, that ledge. We know that because that site has giant megaliths that are already finished near, next to it. And this was about to be incorporated into it. That stone you can see right there, to give you some perspective, is the largest single megalith ever created on Earth. We can't even begin to create something like this. That is 16,000 tons. Okay. Now, remember back, I said that the monolith Tlaq is 170 tons. Remember how big that, that monolith was on that, on that being moved by those vehicles? Now imagine 16,000 tons. How do they move those? We can't move those with cranes today. It's, that exceeds even our capacity with cranes. Anything over about 10,000 tons becomes almost impossible for us to move. Now, so what that means is they were about to incorporate the largest block, megalithic block they'd ever cut into their existing um, project, and then it just, the work stopped, okay? Just vanished. Same thing in Egypt. In, the, in Aswan, Egypt, in the unfinished obelisk, we find that they were about to take out the largest obelisk in the world, and then it just was abandoned. Same thing in Baalbek, Lebanon. Look at that block. They were about to take out that block. That block is 1,000 tons on the bottom right. They were about to take that out, and then they just stopped, abandoned it. But furthermore, each one of these places, like I showed the scoop marks in the other slide, and in Baalbek, Lebanon, and all these places, like in Yangshan, these stones are still in the quarry. They, didn't, they never even took them out. They were like working. Imagine their civilization at the height of their sophistication, building these incredible things, and all of a sudden, a series of catastrophes on Earth comes through that's so significant. Not only do they stop the project, but they're mostly wiped out. And almost all of them died. We have no idea how many people existed at this time period on Earth. We, we don't know. People have speculated. But I can tell you that the remnants of it was, not, was small. And we know that because the projects never really resumed anywhere. The only thing they were able to do, the survivors of this catastrophe were able to just tell stories and provide some knowledge. But most of what these, this civilization that we call the lost civilizations or lost civilization, most of what they know is gone. And, and we may never figure it out again, or will we? Now, 
Here's an example I want to point out. On the left side, that's Gobekli Tepe. Most people have heard of that in Turkey. And on the right is Karahan Tepe, another new site. And another one that I wish I had included in this that I'm going to be talking a lot about in the future is called Zernaki Tepe. It's the newest archaeological discovery in the world. Only found in 2018, and I think that it's one of the, the most significant archaeological finds in the last 50 years. I consider it even more significant than Gobekli Tepe. And anyone who follows my work, checkouts, I, I did a post on that, and it's something that I'm going to be talking a lot, of, a lot more, but there's, a, there's the point I'm trying to make is these sites are still being found. It's not like we know all this. We're still figuring this out, and if th there's more and more that are coming up. Now, what's important about Gobekli Tepe? Well, first of all, those monoliths are enormous, these T-shaped monoliths that they built, multi, multi, multi-ton um, monoliths. But th what's more important is they seem to be tracking a cycle on Earth known as the precession of the equinox. They seem to have a, an understanding of the cosmos and that there's these events that happen, and they're tracking these events. And we know that because each one of these pillars has different constellations on them. Now, some have speculated that they're types of animals or creatures, like Pillar 43. If you look at that, you're like, well, is that a creature that roamed the planet? No, it's a constellation. It's Cygnus and Deneb. They knew about these specific constellations and these places in, sp in, 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 this, in space that were really significant. And one of the strange things is that on Pillar 43, below, uh, above si the depiction of Cygnus and Deneb, are these three handbags. Okay? Three handbags, not one. What is, uh, and that's a perplexing thing because we find this handbag symbol with the passing of knowledge in the pine cone all around the world, especially from the Apkalu, those sages I told you about. They're shown depicted with handbags, which I believe is like the totality of all their knowledge, and then they're passing the knowledge. Now, Pillar 43 has three handbags, not one, three. I believe that it represents knowledge being handed down three times. Three times the civilization had to be recreated, and I believe that that's what we're trying to, is being portrayed here. But more importantly, this is the only site that has been radiocarbon dated accurately because it was buried, and that's a theme that we'll also bring up too, to 11,600 years old, okay? Which, of course, is double the age of when civilization is even supposed to exist here, right? It's supposed to exist in Sumer around 6,000 years old. But yet, this, this site alone is double that age. And of course, we can get into a lot older ages if, we, if you, know, you open up your mind to look at this. But What's interesting about that is that this site was buried deliberately to protect it, okay? The description we get from Plato and Solon in Egypt when they talk about Atlantis, they give them a specific date of when Atlantis was destroyed. They don't say when it was created, but they say when it was destroyed. It was destroyed 11,600 years ago, exactly the same time period that Gobekli Tepe was buried. There, that can't be coincidence. There's no way. There's no such thing as coincidences. That means that this civilization knew that destruction was coming and they buried this site to protect it. In fact, some speculate that the amount of time it took to bury this site took longer than it did to create it, which is amazing to think about because that shows you how important it was that they knew they had to protect this, okay? Now, here's a little movie I want to play um, from Ancient Civilizations on Gaia, season four, which I discuss a lot of this, and it's... Uh, a great example of showing some of these megaliths. One of the things that's echoed in the ancient stories around the world, whether it's not it's Plato talking about Atlantis, or the ancient Egyptians and the Temple of Sais, is that we find that they discuss how these events have come in many different ways. They discuss how they, the civilizations have been destroyed from periods of great flooding, but also extreme heat and fire. So it's not just about one thing, it's about a totality of all of these different catastrophic events that have led to the disappearance and destruction of these pre-Diluvian civilizations. And the way that we have the telltale evidence is that a lot of these ancient megalithic structures from the pre-Diluvian civilizations are left behind is that we find what's known as vitrification on the surface, whether or not it's Egypt or Peru or Turkey. And what that means is that those granite blocks and the quartz that was in them literally melted from such an extreme heat event that in order to do that, you have to have temperatures on the surface that would have exceeded 2,000 degrees. Think about that for a minute. In order for rock to melt, I gave an example at the end of that video I talked about how 
these, these megaliths have evidence of catastrophic damage on them, something that we, I don't think, even have a comprehension of in our time period right now and what we live in, and we talk about, oh my God, you got to like 120 degrees in part of the world or whatever, we talk about that and it's like an extreme thing for us, right? Or on the flip side, we talk about how cold it got. Well, one of th some of the stuff we're going to present here as I go, go forward shows you that those extremes that we've seen on Earth are nothing in comparison to what they saw. And we know that because of climatological data from Greenland and Antarctica. And we're going to get into that in a minute. But uh, give a couple examples just to show as we're talking about this. The top left is in Japan. I showed the Imperial Wall of Japan before. Some of the m finest megaliths in the world in Japan. A lot of people don't know that. Um, they're incorporated into a lot of the structures that they have. L they call them castles in Japan, but they were originally weren't castles. Um, what they simply did is build on the basis the bases of these um, locations. And that the wall there showing the black, you see the black on the wall, that's a vitrification. That's showing you that there was such extreme heat on that structure that it basically scarred and partially melted that rock. And those are, those are granite blocks. And as I said in the end of that video, in order to do that, to melt quartz or granite, you would have to have temperatures that reached or exceeded 2,000 degrees at the surface. I want you to wrap that your head around that for a minute. Imagine the record, what is the, the hottest temperature on Earth I think that's been recorded? Um, it was either in part of Africa or was it, um, it was like 135 or 140 degrees or something like that. Now imagine 2,000. You would basically be vaporized if you were on the surface of the Earth during that time period. That is what we're finding because these structures are scarred and burned and, and melted, showing us that these things indeed happened. Now look at the second image is Eridu. Um, in ancient, and it's supposed to be the first city, e according to ancient texts, the Sumerians, Akkadians, Babylonians, it was the first city ever created on Earth. Okay, And they, that site also has the rocks that are right above it and around it have what's vitrification evidence as well. Not only that, but images you can find of the ziggurat of Eridu still have seashells covering the top of the temple. And it's described that it was destroyed in a great flood. Hmm. That's kind of strange, right? We find seashells from the ocean on top of the temple deposited, and it's supposed to be destroyed by a flood. How are you supposed to incorporate that into modern, like, archaeological thinking, mainstream thinking? It doesn't make any sense. When did the ocean, when did the Persian Gulf, and potentially maybe even the Mediterranean Sea from the north, when did they reach such flood stages that they could flood all of Sumer? Furthermore, some people may not know, but the Great pyramids of Egypt, um, especially the largest pyramid, um, has evidence f um, upwards of 120 feet up on the pyramids of salt incursion. Okay, We find it all over Giza. We find it in the Tomb of the Birds. We find it on these pyramids. Salt water incursion on the structure over 100 feet up. That means that the pyramids were flooded with ocean. Flooded and that that salt was deposited and left over. So once you start taking some of that data and then taking the stories of these ancient civilizations, it starts to make so much sense that they had suffered catastrophes that are beyond our comprehension. It's like something out of an apocalyptic Hollywood movie. Okay? Um, the bottom left image, that is Peru. That is a, um, that's a, that's a snake temple to this ancient, ser ancient serpent. It's a very important symbol to the ancient people. But look at the, the scarring on that, on that block. That is, that granite block was blackened, but only in one spot. Isn't that peculiar? It's not like the whole thing is black. It's a strip, meaning that the ozone must have opened up in these little holes around the Earth. And s I don't know if anyone's ever seen the movie The Core. Has anyone ever seen that? Very, I feel like it's one of these movies that n like most people have never heard of, and it doesn't really get a lot of attention, and it's kind of strange because there's a lot of truth in that movie. And there's, a, there's a scene in that movie where they talk about how satellites had picked up on a hole that had opened up in the ozone, and it was it basically a, the hole was facing the, um, the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. Okay? And this hole opens up, and then the sun is able to pass through these, 
massively powerful um, solar rays in, um, into the earth and it like melts the bridge, right? That's what we're looking at here. We're finding some kind of a, a weakening of the magnetic sphere of the earth occurred, potentially pole shifts and different things that allowed this bombardment of these very, very powerful solar rays. Now, other researchers such as, you know, Graham Hancock and Ayn Randall Carlson, which I have a lot of respect for, they believe that it was a cosmic impact. Now, I don't disagree with the idea that cosmic impacts have played a role, but I have a hard time accepting that when I haven't found any impact craters anywhere on the Earth that are younger than 13,000 years old. They discussed how there's an impact crater they found under the ice in Greenland as one of the ones that they use as, as an example of what that impact crater is, but how could that be from 13,000 years ago if it's covered in an ice cap? Does it, it doesn't make sense because we know that the, the ice caps in Greenland are at least 50,000 years old. So the more we look at this, the more that we're looking at a combination of different events. And I want to give one more example. One of the, f um, one of the examples they use as, as a cosmic impact comes from the Libyan desert glass. Have you guys heard of this? It's the purest desert glass in the world, and it's all over Libya and in parts of Egypt. And it was so important to them that they would, some of the pharaohs of Egypt would actually go and find them and incorporate them into some of their, um, their archaeological work. But w one of the interesting studies that I came across was that here we have the largest, the largest set of, of desert glass in the world in this site, okay? It's strewn across the deserts, and it's very pure silica, meaning that the quartz that was there melted and, and basically turned into glass, okay? There was a study done where archaeologists tried to go find impact craters in Libya and in northern Africa. And they searched and they used a lot of different techniques and they were baffled because they were unable to find any impact craters anywhere at all. And so they're like, well, how can, how can this glass be created if there's no impact crater? And that's one of the pieces of evidence that leads me to be believing that no, I don't think there was an impact. I think we're talking about a massive solar event. It's, and I think that's one of, the, one of the researchers that really hones in on that is Robert Schock. And he, one of the examples he gives for that is there are a lot of petroglyphs and things that have been carved that look like these, almost like people in the sky. They're like, it's like from a plasma event, okay? So if you had the magnetic sphere of our Earth get weakened and you had powerful solar rays being, uh, start affecting the planet, the first thing you would see is strange things in the sky. You would have these pulses of energy that would make these strange depictions in the night sky, and of course, aurora borealis and all these things around the Earth. But you would have these signs that something's happening. And they knew that. And that was to them a warning that something was happening because you see that weakening occurring and then you have all kinds of other things start happening around the Earth. And we're gonna go over those. The other image on the right that goes into this and talks about this, this is called the Colossi of Memnon. This is outside of the Temple of Ramses, and this is, these are the largest two um, monoliths in the world. And they are, suffer, they have catastrophic damage on them. And if you read about in, in modern mainstream archaeology, they say that it was from certain earthquakes that have happened, like in the last, you know, 200, 300 years or whatever. But the interesting thing is that we find vitrification on the northeast part of both of these structures, okay, the northeast corner. And when we look around the world at other places, we find the same thing. It's a very specific point in which these um, massive amounts of heat and this destruction seem to have happened at a specific point in the sky. It, that connects you just furthermore to thinking that these holes opened up in certain places. And that's why we find it very distinctly. Now furthermore, Almost all of these ancient structures that we know of that are part of this time period, they, um, they were basically masters at understanding how to align themselves to magnetic north and south and then the solstices, right? But the problem is that these sites around the world that we identify as being much, much older and more sophisticated, they're all off magnetic north by 23 and a half degrees. All of them. Everywhere in the world, they're off by 23 and a half degrees. And one of the things that that points us to is like, well, look, that means that when they built them, magnetic north was in a different place than it is today. And that means that when that shifted, that shift is during the same time period 
that wiped them out. Now we're talking about a potential axial, axial shift of the Earth, a magnetic shift of the Earth. Basically, if you had the combination of those things happening, um, it would be something, I think, that unless you were able to go underground, you would never survive. And that's what we're finding. Look at, look today at, in, in Turkey, one of the centra central points of the Earth, this high plateau um, landmass, we have the largest underground cities in the world that have ever been created, okay? Right outside of Zernaki Tepe, Gobekli Tepe, Karahan Tepe, just north of ancient Mesopotamia is the largest set of underground cities in the world. Coincidence again? That these civilizations went to such great lengths to create places like Darren Kuyu that have the ability to, to hold 20,000 people. Now, we're told that the Hittites created that and that they, were, they created that to go down and to hide during war. But how, if you had an army after you and they knew that you were underground, how would that in any way be a secure thing for, for, for you at all? It doesn't make any sense. Furthermore, how would that be a secure thing either um, for potentially like if it was just a flood, right? Underground is not necessarily a great place to go for a flood. You want to go up high. So then why would they go underground? Well, if you have temperatures on the surface that are exceeding 2,000 degrees in some cases, and you have basically like a radioactive um, world where you can't even be outside, the only safe place to be would be on deep underground. That would be the only way you could survive these events, and I think that's exactly what happened. So think about Gobekli Tepe for a minute. Those, cons the, the, those who uh, constructed that site knew the importance of it. They knew they know this event's happening, or maybe it was happening as they were doing it. They bury it to come back to, or for someone else to be able to find if they don't. And then what happens? They never come back to the site. What that means is that they must have not survived. Even though, though they went underground, they still didn't survive. And that, is, that just is, is further telling on how incredible these events were during what's known as the time period in between the transition of the Pleistocene to the Holocene, known as the Younger Dryas. And this is just one time period that we're going to be talking about because there are others too. It's not just that one. Um, now here's an example. This is Robert Schock. I love Robert Schock's work. He just posted this a few months ago. Now up until recently, it was considered that Gobekli Tepe was the only site in the world that was deliberately buried, that the other ones were sort of caught off guard. But what Robert Schock is finding out, the more that they look into the Great Sphinx and ancient temples like Edfu and Kam Ambo and Osirion is that when they look at old depictions of that from when they were first discovered and before, they were completely buried. Now, some would say, well, maybe that's just the sand moving around and burying them, but Robert Schock is talking about how they're finding evidence that even the sites in Egypt were deliberately buried too, and that the, the dynastic pharaohs that came later probably uncovered them. But we're seeing the same thing around the world is that these civilizations seem to have an awareness of these events in some way where they tried to protect them and tried to survive, but they didn't. And if this civilization, imagine if you are a civilization that understands all the energy of the earth and the cosmos, and you're in tune with the cycles, and you're in tune with the solstices and everything, and, you have, and, and you're not a materialistic culture, so you're able to, knowledge is the forefront of your civilization, and you have all these different perspectives than we did today. Imagine them not surviving. I mean, it, how would we survive if they couldn't survive with all that they knew? And that's what's scary about this. But I don't think it's that scary. Because the more you look into it, the more that you may find that, look, we may be the only civilization in our entire history of our civilizations rising and falling that I believe is going to make it. The only one ever. I don't think there's ever been a civilization that made it through one of these cycles. And I think that's because even though they had so many things that we, sh I, I guess I should say, should have the mindsets they had of the universe and the consciousness of, of the earth and understanding the stars, even though we should have that and I believe we, we need to, they, they were lacking one thing. They were lacking the technological sophistication that we do. And I think that's what en may end up being our saving grace in the end. And I don't want to say that early on because I don't want to scare everybody as I'm going through this. But we'll get to that as we go. Okay. So here is our best way to understand what happened. 
we look at ice core samples from two, two of the largest glaciers on Earth, Greenland and Antarctica. Now, Antarctica is a much older ice cap than Greenland, so it allows us to go further back. But Greenland is also important because at least it gives us an idea of what happened like within the last 20,000 years. So we use a combination of both. Now, the image on the right is the best representation I've found for understanding where the continental ice sheets were during the last glaciation period of Earth. And that is what basically ended with the Younger Dryas, was the last ice age. Now, I don't know if people know, but it's been estimated that looking at bones across the world and these giant boneyards from mammoths and, and lions and tigers from that time period, that over 100 million mammals perished during Younger Dryas. We literally saw the extinction of entire species across megafauna across the northern hemisphere. So many, in fact, that um, we're talking about some of the hardiest animals that have ever existed in Earth's history. They not only disappeared, but it looks like what happened during this time period was so severe that it caught them off guard and basically killed them instantly. Now imagine a woolly mammoth, okay? Imagine woolly mammoth, which I consider to be probably the hardiest, besides like maybe a bison, the hardiest animals on Earth. They can survive temperatures over 100 below zero. And they, it's an incredible animal. They like literally dig through the snow and tundra to eat. Um, very, very difficult to, to reach food. They're finding, um, when they went up in the early 1900s into, into northern Siberia and Alaska, they're finding remnants of these species that had died in very mysterious ways. So one of the things that m mainstream archaeologists talk about is that these species died and went extinct from overhunting. But we find no tool marks on them. We find no tool marks. We find nothing. All we know is that between 44 and 100 million mammals went extinct during this event. Now, is it, is it a surprise that that happened at the same time period that these ancient civilizations all disappeared too? It's not. Now, I want to add one more thing to that. There's a famous mammoth that was found in northern Siberia called the Beresovka mammoth. Has anybody heard of that? The Beresovka mammoth was famous because it had died and been preserved in a way where we could study and try to understand. What they found was that this mammoth had frozen instantly. Not only that, but it had undigested food not only in its stomach, but in its throat. Okay? This mammoth froze so fast that it was never even able to putrefy, which means rot. It froze instantly. They had some studies done on what kind of temperatures could do that. They found out that it's 150 degrees below zero. Okay? The, the coldest temperature ever recorded that's come out of Vostok, Antarctica was like a negative 128. So we're talking about temperatures that are colder than anything we've ever experienced in modern human history, okay? Not only that, but there's another thing that's fascinating about this too. When they were first investigating northern Siberia and exploring it, they not only did they find all these giant mammoth boneyards and all these megaliths, uh, megafauna around the world that had died and basically were covered in like volcanic ash and frozen and all these different things, but they found something very peculiar. Um, there was a man named Toll that went up and it was investigating um, Siberia and he found a 30 foot alder or fig tree growing roughly 300 miles north of where it should have been. Okay? If, if this enormous tree, and if anyone knows, if anyone's like traveled up into northern areas with tundra and ice caps, anything that can grow is like tiny, 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 right? I mean, it's very, very small. The most you're going to get is like. Um, the boreal forest with the conifers that grow in the, in, the, in the taiga forest. But what we're talking about is that a 30-foot tree was found where it's not supposed to be, and this is directly leading into that image on the right. I want you to look at that while I'm mentioning this. Notice the area of Siberia in this, in this depiction of the glaciers uh, around 13,000 years ago. There's no ice. You see that? It's, a, it's very strange. There's no ice across Alaska or Siberia. Now, Edward Toll goes up to northern Siberia in 1901 and finds a 30-foot alder tree when he was finding these mammoths that was completely frozen with green leaves. It means that the temperatures that had wiped those mammoths out 
was not during winter. It was during summer. And the temperatures in summer in northern Siberia, it means that they went to 150 degrees below zero in summer, killing all of these mammoths and, and destroying all of um, basically the, the whole world in this time period. And, and I have another image coming up in a second that can show that, talking about this. But that means that the temperatures warmed so warm out ahead of this event on Earth that these strange giant trees were growing where they're not supposed to, and then they all just were like wiped out and destroyed. Now, getting back to what I just said a second ago, look at, the, uh, look at where the ice forms today. It, it basically forms in a circular pattern around the North Pole, because that's the coldest place on Earth, besides the South Pole. And, but in this depiction of where glaciers were, and by the way, I would just want to add to that, is we know that the glaciers were in these positions because we find glacial moraine evidence of the gravels and the types of movement and the effects they did on the geology around the world. We know that the Laurentide Ice Sheet ended right at Manhattan and Long Island because Long Island is a giant moraine. As the glaciers plow all this material forward, when they stop and they retreat, they basically leave all this stuff in front of it. And that's what Long Island is. It's a giant glacial moraine, okay? So we know where the glaciers were based on the evidence that they have around the world for how they disrupted the landscape and how they altered things around them. But this is what's so strange. There are people that have studied this, uh, experts um, like Hapgood and others, who have looked at this and said, wait a minute, why are the ice caps in this location? It doesn't make any sense. They're not around the North Pole. They're in places that they really shouldn't be. Now, at the same time, They've done studies on ancient sites like Eridu and a lot of these other, supposedly the first cities created in Mesopotamia, and they've found alignments to Magnetic North nowhere near where they are today. Remember I said that 23 and a half degrees offset of these megaliths? Well, these temples are also basically pointing to a completely different place where Magnetic North, North was. Now, where was it? In Greenland. That's where the Magnetic North Pole was during the Younger Dryas and pre-Younger Dryas was in Greenland, meaning that you had a shift of hundreds and hundreds of miles of the magnetic North Pole where it is today, and it's still moving. So we know that that happens, okay? So here's a great chart looking basically directly from the ice cores that came out of Greenland. And this is something that I want people to truly like wrap their heads around um, because we're told today that, you know, everything that's happening on the Earth is based on us and that there's no other cycles and there's no natural phenomenon that are based on cycles and warming and cooling on the Earth. But what we're finding is that even though we may be per likely perpetuating a natural cycle by pumping you know, CO2 and all these different greenhouse gases, the series of events that have happened in our past of warming and cooling is almost like the time period we're in right now, you, c you almost can't even see it. It almost is like not even be, be able to shown on this graph. But look between 15,000 years ago and about 11,000 years ago. Now, this is what's, what's fascinating to me about this is remember the, the alder tree in northern Siberia and the frozen mammoths and all these things? Look at how it mimics this precisely, right? So look at, the f look at 14,000, almost 15,000 years ago on this chart. Look at the spike right there on temperatures coming out of a, a very, very cold time period, which was, a, which was a glaciation period on Earth, look at that spike out of nowhere, right? That spike was that rise in temperature that allowed that alder tree to grow where it's not supposed to. That's what that spike is, right there, right before the Younger Dryas con considering time period. That means that the Earth, for some reason, and we can go into speculation on why, rose temperatures so fast that it basically went the opposite of where it was in a matter of years. It went so, so warm that it was basically warmer than it is now, okay? And then look what happened. It only stayed like that for a short time, and then it crashed again, okay? Then it got really warm again. Now, in this time period is, is the evidence for what destroyed these civilizations around the world and what caused the megafauna during the Pleistocene to, to the Holocene to basically vanish and disappear. It was from this time period. Now, does that mean that this, this cycle is every 13,000 years? Well, that's what we're going to get into in a second, because 
one of the speculations and one of the worries is when is this going to happen again? Okay? And we're going to get into some reasons why, and I want to make sure I don't run out of time, so I've got I to go a little bit quicker here. Um, one of the, why? You know, why is this happening? Well, um, let me see here. I want to just add something to this before I go to the next one really quick. When we look at Antarctic ice cores that go further back, we can go back 500 million years when we look at Antarctic ice cores. That is an ancient, ancient ice sheet. It's a time, time capsule for what happened on Earth. What we're finding, and that I've been extensively studying and looking into, is that I'm not finding a 13,000 year cycle. I'm finding something like more of like a 100,000 year cycle. And what, what's fascinating about these ice cores from Antarctica is that when you see these rises and dips, and then intervals and then rises and dips every 100,000 years, they're almost identical. It's actually kind of strange and, and to look at because you would think there'd be some fluctuation, but they're nearly identical, showing you that whatever this cycle is, it's been happening here for a long time. It's been happening here for at least several hundred thousand years, at least. And that's interesting because it helps us to understand that whatever's causing it has been happening for a long time. So it can't just be passing through the torrid meteor shower and just crossing your fingers that one of those objects hits because it wouldn't happen like clockwork. One of the things that's, un that's not understood is like, look at the asteroid belt um, outside of um, Mars. We're often it's often depicted like if you were to try to fly through that with a spacecraft, that you have to navigate through asteroids and everything. But what, what it's actually very, very spaced out. Objects are not close together at all, which means that if you were to go through something like the torrid meteor shower, there'd be no guarantee that one of those objects would actually hit. It would be like a sporadic thing. But we're finding consistency that's uncanny, meaning that it has to be something else besides impact craters. That's why I look out into space. And you look at the fact that we have um, some telltale signs that there's something going on in, the, in our solar system and beyond our inner solar system that I find to be fascinating and I think is very under-researched and under-talked about. Uh, and I like to think that I'm one of the people that is making this basically my, um, my passion and one, and one of my things I want to leave behind is focusing on this aspect right here. Because not a lot of people are talking about it, and I don't know why. But that's better for me anyway, right? Because it's, it's nice to have that niche where you can talk about something that not everybody's talking about. So one of the things that was discovered is that the planets in our solar system, as you progress outward beyond Mars, uh, beyond Jupiter, like Neptune and Uranus, they're all tilted on their axis. All of them are. And they're, they're tilted in a varying degree more and more as you pass further and further out. So whatever is doing that is, is far away, but it's consistent. And that's the thing that's important, it's consistent. And so NASA was really curious, and of course, I want to just give like a, a, um, a brief comment on this before I have people being like, wow, you can't believe anything NASA says. Well, kind of. There is some truth to what they say. There, it's more deception now than it used to be. Um, minus like the moon landing stuff. But there's <laughs> back, believe it or not, back in the 1980s and 90s, NASA was a little bit more honest than they are now. Um, maybe that's because they didn't know what they f ended up figuring out. And I have a whole rabbit hole we can go down on that and why. So a lot of people have heard about the, vi the, the, the Voyager probes, right? It usually makes the news. People hear about that. It passed out to our solar system. But nobody talks about the Pioneer probes. Nobody. And, I, and it's very perplexing to me because they were a long time before the Voyager probes. The Pioneer probes were the first spacecraft with data that we could look at the solar system that passed out of our inner solar system any time in history. It's the first time we ever got a glimpse of what was going on beyond the inner solar system. And in 1971, Pioneer 10 became the first craft that was launched into space to go investigate. And the primary purpose, and they're not going to tell you this, but the primary purpose behind Pioneer 10, because they were trying to figure out why these planets are tilted on their axis and why the entire solar system seems to be tilted. So they sent, they sent Pioneer 10 out, and then in 1972, they sent Pioneer 11 out. 
and they sent them in completely different directions because they wanted, they didn't know what they were looking for. And of course, space is a three-dimensional thing, so you have to go different ways to try to find things. So they send these out, and they had no idea what they were going to expect because they were very open with sharing the information early on. And that's how you know. And they were talking about it, and it was a very exciting thing. In fact, Pioneer 10 had a plaque on it where it was like, here we are, humans, this is what we like. If anyone finds this, you know, basically this is what we're like. And, and, they, and they send it out. And in 1983, Pioneer 10 became the first craft to pass into interstellar space. We had never been there before, okay? And, and what they found is astonishing. And it became, in my opinion, probably the greatest conspiracy in I, and I know that's a bold statement, but I think it's the greatest conspiracy that's ever been hid, hidden from society, was the Pioneer 10 data. Most people, if you ever even mention Pioneer, the Pioneer probes, they've never even heard of it, which is such a strange thing if this is the first craft to ever reach the outer solar system. So what are you looking at right here? I want to introduce this, okay, so you understand what you're looking at. This is an encyclopedia that came out in 1987 called the New Science and Invention Encyclopedia. Of course, this is before computers were really, really a big deal. So whenever someone wanted information, they pop open their encyclopedia guides. It's how you got your information. Now, I don't know why, and I don't know what the reasons were, but this is the only place anywhere, and I mean anywhere. Go ahead and scour the internet after you're done this talk. Scour the internet. Try to find anything you can on what Pioneer of 10 found. You won't. It's like it's been scrubbed, and no one has ever talked about it again. And this depiction is the only one I've ever been able to find. And it's fascinating because, first of all, this is from the 1987 New Science and Invention Encyclopedia, one of the most important encyclopedia versions in, in the world. It was like a sought-after way to find information. And for some reason, they included a diagram of the Pioneer 10 and 11's journey and what they found, but they didn't even say anything about it. Right? Imagine a discovery of a, of a binary dead companion star. How would that change our entire understanding of our solar system? And yet they don't even talk about it. It's not, there's, if you read the page, and of course this is page 2488, if you look at that, all they say in the depiction is that it was the first craft to pass into space. The diagram shows the path of the two pioneer probes. I find it so funny that this is in there and yet they talk nothing about it but it's not depicted anywhere else. It's so strange, right? So let me give you some, some reasoning on why I think this is the greatest conspiracy and cover-up in comparison to, and some people are going to roll their eyes, but in the 1990s, late 1980s and early 1990s, NASA had mentioned this planet right here. Okay, you see it says the 10th planet? This is before Pluto was de demoted, so this would, this would now be the 9th planet, okay? They announced it to the world. Does anybody remember that, by the way? They came out with a press announcement, and I remember it's like the wording, and I have it written down, but it's like they found a planet beyond the Kuiper belt that was four to five times the size of Earth. And, and they were like talking about it. It was like, and there was a lot of people discussing it, and there's some famous astronomers that were looking into it, Robert Harrington and Thomas Van Flandern. Robert Harrington was the head of the U.S. Naval Academy for uh, astronomical studies. And he ended up getting some of the data from Pioneer. He was fascinated with, with this planet. And his colleague, Thomas Van Flandern, was the only reason, was the reason he figured out about it, because Thomas Van Flandern found this data. And they're both mainstream, mainstream astronomers. And they started heavily looking into this, trying to get into the, the orbital track of it, its impacts, all these different things. Tom, and Thomas Van Flandern and Robert Harrington both mysteriously died within years of each other. They both died, both of them, of throat cancer. Both of them. And then after they, they passed away, there was a man named Miles Standish that came in that was like the head of the astronomical department, and he came up with a statement that said that all of the mathematical data associated with the Pioneer Probe data, Robert Harrington, Thomas Van Flandern, and anything that was discussed was mathematical inaccuracies. And then, of course, most of society was like, oh, okay, never mind. That, that's fine. And then it just disappeared. Poof. Gone. And nobody talks about it anymore. Okay? Now, remember I just said that NASA gave that press announcement in the early 1990s about this planet. They were, like, they were talking about it. It was, an, it was I have a quote from it. I, I wrote it, I think it was 1991. 
they, they were talking about it, and there was a lot of excitement around this planet. And then everything went silent. Now, imagine, if you will, not knowing what's causing this cycle, not knowing why everything's tilted on its axis, and, you, and Pioneer 10 passes beyond the inner solar system and it finds a planet. Well, you would know that that planet's not big enough to have a gravitational influence to cause all of that. So you'd be like, oh, that's cool, though. We, we found, look what we found. I want to share it to the world, right? But then look what happens. You go further, further, the Pioneer probes go further, and then they detect something else. They detect something so significant that it basically scares the shit out of them, okay, to be frank. It scares them so much that they bury all the Pioneer 10 data. Thomas Van Flandern and Robert Harrington disappear, and nobody ever hears about this again. But look what it depicts. Pioneer 10 and 11, both of them, completely different directions in the solar system, both detect the same object, right? Notice what it says in between it, too. It says equal pull. It means that this object is so big that it's affecting gravitationally the entire solar system in an equal way. That is massive, okay? Now, what do they find? Well, 50 billion miles away, they find what their, uh, some of the, some of the techno technologies they had on board using sensors and looking at things, they figure out that there is a dead star, and they use the term dead star, that a star exists out there that's dark, you can't see it, but it still exists, and it's dead. It's 50 billion miles away at, in 1983, and then that's all we know. So, that, so we have a binary companion star that is so faint and so far away and so dark, that's why some have called it the dark star, or the black sun, that you can't see it. Only way you know it's there is by its influences, okay? Now, they call it a dead star. So what does that mean? It means that the star exploded at some point in our history, not, well, not our history, in Earth's history, in the solar system's history. At some point it exploded, but rather, only two things can, two things are common to happen when the star explodes. You either get a supernova with a massive event, or you, or, or that star, and its star kind of turns into like a dark star, like, like this, a dead star, or it turns into a black hole. Now, in this case, this, this binary companion star that's very, very far away, uh, exploded and then turned into this dead star. And one of the things that I'm doing a lot of research on, and I'm going to incorporate into the new book, is I'm going much, much further. I'm saying, well, and we're going to get into this really quick in a second about how this impacts Earth. But not only do I think that this impacted Younger Dryas, but I think this may be the cause of every single glaciation and deglaciation event and every cycle related to Earth in over the course of the last several hundred thousand years, if not million years. We have no idea when this star exploded. But I, if I was going to speculate, because I love to just, I'm not afraid to go out there a little bit, and I, and I know that this may not be, it, this could just be um, a theory, but I have looked at the fact that based on the extinction level events that have occurred on Earth throughout her, Earth's history, and based on the fact that we have had extinctions that are, are so severe that they've almost wiped out, wiped out microbial life on this planet, that this object has been one of the major players in destroying life on this planet. And that its, its effect on our sun is what is causing these cycles. Okay, so let's, let's get into this for a second then. Now imagine you have an orbital dance going on with our central sun and this binary companion. But their, their orbital tracks, the way that they rotate around each other, is enormous. I, I'm, I'm beginning to believe, looking at some of the data that's been proposed, that the precession of the equinox, a 26,000 year cycle of looking at the different constellations, basically a wobble of the Earth, may be caused by this, by this object. Because we're, we're looking at the fact that it may have a 26,000 year orbit, which is exactly the same time period as the precession of the equinox on Earth, okay? Now, um, there's a documentary, I don't think anyone's ever seen, called The Great Year. Has anyone ever seen that? They highly recommend it. It's one of the best documentaries I've ever seen, and they speculate that the precession of the equinox is caused by some kind of companion object. Now, they, they say it's serious, but to me, that doesn't make sense. It's too far away. 
this, this is to me what is causing this. Now, if you, looking at this for a second, imagine, if we will, that if, let's say it has an orbital track of 26,000 years, meaning that if it, when it comes closest to our sun, known as perihelion, it, its effects occur across the solar system and our sun. Now, if we have a cycle of glaciation on the Earth that's 100,000 years, then it wouldn't account for that, that exact rotational cycle unless there's other players involved, unless there's things like um, alignments of planets that happen to coincide exactly when the, ap the perihelion occurs and that glaciation occurs when perihelion occurs, which means f when this object goes the furthest away. There may be a lot of complexities in this that we don't understand. And I think that there's a lot that we need to investigate in how this is influencing our sun and how it's influencing our civilization. Now, all we know, though, based on this, is that if everything is tilted like that, and this, this has a rotational um, perihelion of some time period, let's say maybe it's 26,000 years, but the, the point is, when it gets closest to us, our sun, what happens is, when you have a mass that is a gigantic um, nucleus of energy like this, which is the sun, if it goes, has tremendous amounts of energy that are affecting it, in order for it not to explode in, in, in supernova, it has to expel energy. That's how it works, right? So it's super, basically when you look at coronal mass ejections from the sun, not these little ones that they talk about, but I mean something massive. When you look at those, it would mean that the sun is basically expelling tremendous amounts of energy during certain time periods, I believe, of when perihelion occurs with this dead star. And if that's the case, imagine how it would then trickle down to the effects we see on this civilization, right? Met the magnetic sphere weakening on the planet, the poles shifting, the vitrification and melting on these objects, a lack of impact craters, right? Underground cities need to be created because you can't even be on the surface. Uh, I could go on and on. How about tectonic sh plates shifting all around the world? Atlantis is described by the temple priests of Sais as sinking beneath the ocean. And one of the things you would happen is if you had your a weakening of the magnetic sphere and the, and, the, and the poles, you would get tectonic shifts and earth crustal displacement all around the planet. And that you would literally have examples, like I believe what happened to Atlantis, was that the plate it was on subducted. It went underneath another plate, and that's why it's described as basically going down into the ocean and disappearing. Because this time period that is described during Younger Dryas and Shone had volcanoes going, across, going off across the entire Earth. You had tectonic sh plates shifting. You had tsunamis going around the world after earthquakes would go off. And I mean earthquakes that were probably like 12, 12 or more on the Richter scale. With tsunamis that are described as these great, great deluges and floods in civilizations, they were so high that they reached the Andes Mountains in Machu Picchu. So we're talking about tsunamis that would have had to have been more than two miles high. And that's why you would basically get these stories of civilizations talking about how a flood like wiped them out. Because we're not talking about like raining a lot and then water just kind of creeps up. We're talking about something completely different, like a wall of water. And furthermore, remember I talked about the mammoths. When they find these mammoth graveyards all across the north, they have found them completely covered in volcanic ash. So again, all these pieces are coming together for us to try to understand you know, what is causing this and, and, and why, is it, why, is, why is it the fact that these ancient civilizations, why did they just disappear? And, and how does this relate to now with us? So this, uh, this is the last slide um, and I have, I have to take, I have like two minutes left. So I want to just summarize this. Uh, there's so much more. There's so much data, data to pile through. There's so many things to study here. But truly one of the things that um, one of the things I'm passionate about is I want to know, I want to know. I want to know what happened, but more, than, more importantly, I want to rewrite the human story. Because imagine what we've gone through. Imagine a civilization reaching such heightened levels of sophistication that they're in tune with the stars and the universe and everything you can imagine that would make them the highest conscious beings that we've ever had on the planet. Now imagine if they went through these events, the struggles of whoever could survive, and it wasn't just about like a primitive survival, but 
these sages and mystics, you know, if they could keep the knowledge and pass it down so that we wouldn't just end up in the Stone Age and then have to start over again. The problem is we did. And imagine them passing that down and trying so hard to restart civilization and then these events, different kinds of events keep happening and then we just keep getting knocked back further and further. And then when we, well, like what we're told in ancient Sumer and 6,000 years ago in the rise of that civilization, that's true. But that's like, those are almost like the young kids in the block. Those are almost like the, the most recent history of us. There's so much more that goes beyond them. And I think that these ancient sites around the world are just different epics of civilizations that have come and gone. And it's, I think it's our responsibility to take who we are really seriously and how important we are to the cosmos and how important we are to Earth and the universe and what we really are. Because our story is important. And we have come through so much to get to where we are now. And we're still here. And that's what's so amazing about all of this, is that here we are, and we have the means for the first time to prevent our own destruction. And I think that's why there's so much secrecy involved in this, in building underground things and all this stuff that we've seen with the government in different areas, is that they're very aware of this. And we are quietly preventing our own destruction. And maybe that's the way it has to be, because if it wasn't, people would probably panic and different things like that. But I just want to say that everything that I've seen based on potentially some of the secret projects that are going on to Antarctica, and there's like a whole other area that we could talk about where I believe they're using technology to be basically say prevent this from happening, um, which is why the poles are wobbling right now and why they're doing these giant ice core drilling operations in Antarctica. I mean, how many, how many ice cores can you take before you're like, you know what it is, right? So what, you know, why is every nation down in Antarctica, and what are they doing? There's got, there's, they, to me, if you look at the toroidal mass energy field of the Earth, the energy basically moves outward from, from the south of the Earth, and it moves up in the north. So if you wanted to go somewhere to use technology to prevent m entire poles shifting and the magnetic sphere uh, being uh, um, disrupted, you would have to go there. So it's not a coincidence to me that they're doing something down there, and I think they're using probably Nikola Tesla technology or something. But the point is, I think that they're basically, we're going to get through this for the first time in history, and we're going to reach a new phase of our, of our story that we've never been before. Kind of a merging of spirituality and, and technology in the same place. And I'm really excited to see where we go, because to me, this is the most exciting time we've ever been on the Earth. Everything, so, things, so many things are happening, and we're at the cusp of so much greatness. And I think we need to remember to not lose ourselves in materialism and th this fake world that we live in and try to remember what they knew, try to have the mindset that they had. And I think we need to bring that back and make, us, and make it part of us. And I think that's where we're going. It's what's so great about something like the Conscious Life Expo, right? Get all the types of people together that are of that mindset and just grow that as much as we can until we shift consciousness on the planet. I want to just say thank you so much to everyone. Uh, I truly appreciated that, and um, thank you. <laughs> thank you, guys. <laughs>